Hello Church, this is our second week of Faith Promise Emphasis and I wanted to show you the faces and the voices of those that go on mission trips with Mission Church. Hi, my name is Amanda Thurman and I go on the Mexico mission trip with my family for several reasons, but the top two that stick out to me are um, not only getting to serve the families um, that we build the houses for and the children in VBS, but the fellowship with the church is um, is so great. Our time at the church in the evening and just getting to know people of all different ages is such a blessing. I go on the family mission trip because it provides hope to people who don't have very much hope. Zachary, why do you go on the Mexico mission trip? I like to help people. Why missions trips? For me, it's the opportunity to be able to connect with people from my community who I probably wouldn't have been able to connect with in a new environment, such as in the Romania trip, having all the guys uh, living in the same building and all of us being able to experience Barry making his famous scrambled eggs, which just helped in bringing us all even closer together. I go on the mission trips because I love meeting the new people and building relationships with the families and the people there and making the relationships that last. I go on the family mission trip because just taking five days out of my life, actually three days working with my friends and my family can change someone else's family for generations. Jesus says in the book of Mark, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to all creation. Being a part of our local missions community and serving within local mission opportunities allows us to fulfill that great command. And it's a whole lot of fun. Well, those are the voices and the faces of those that go. We'd love for you to join us in 2021 on a mission trip. We thank you for your participation in Faith Promise. One of the projects that we are involved with is a young church in the northern part of Bolivia in the capital city of Trinidad. It is called Casa Nazarena. It is about a three-year-old ministry that was started by Larry and Judy Webb. And I, myself, Vic Enschelmeyer, have been on three trips and will be leading a trip this coming summer, Lord willing. And we invite you to participate in the trip or to support financially or in prayer. The young congregation is very enthusiastic about the support coming from the United States when we come down on mission trips. What we do is we work on physically building facilities there. We have finished the first building and are working on two others. We also do a medical clinic. We do a Bible study, a vacation Bible school with the children, and we also show the Jesus film. Casa Nazarena uh, facilities the worship center has been completed. We are now working on a dormitory and water filtration plant and also on a daycare center. We plan a trip this coming July. If you would be interested, contact the church office or myself or Barry Jones, our missions director, and we would be glad to give you information on how to be involved. Thanks, Mission Church, for partnering with the Nazarene Southern California District and allowing us to minister to the people of Mexico. Gracias, Mission Church, 
por asociarse con el Distrito Nazareno del Sur de California y permitirnos ministrar a nuestros hermanos en México. Thank you, Mission Church, for partnering with Amor Ministries so we can build homes for those families in need in Mexico. Thank you. Hi, Barry. It was so good to hear from you and get caught up on how things are going at, at Mission Church. Um, I know that you have your Faith Promise weekend coming up next weekend, and that's a very important weekend for you, and it also is for our ministry, the, the generosity of Mission Church and all you have done for CASA over the years, your faithfulness every month and for the special projects and for the visiting groups has made a real difference for us. Just to get you caught up a little bit on what's happening at CASA, we've been hit pretty hard by um, COVID-19. Over half of our children and over half of our staff um, has, has had the virus and everyone has recovered well and they're virus free right now. Only one of our employees really had a difficult time and uh, she's doing much better now, our teacher, Gabriella. But uh, we thank um, we thank God for helping us through that. We haven't been able to get supplies and and things across the border to to help Casa the way that we did before COVID, and uh, we're just starting to get that started again now. But because of your generosity, because of the amazing gifts from your church and and other folks who love Casa and love the children of Casa, this somehow has been a very um, good year for Casa financially. God has blessed us in so many ways. And uh, we are so very grateful to him for that. One of the things that's happening is we are, um, our vision is changing at CASA and we're becoming very much more involved in adoption. We are now involved in our first international ad adoption. Fact is there's a couple from, um, from San Diego that is currently involved in adopting Rodrigo, if you remember Huero, and his sister Sofia. And that should be finalized sometime in the next few months. And we're excited about that might have an opportunity to have uh, two kids from CASA there in the church to, uh, to, see, to see you and to talk about CASA. Anyway, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for, su for supporting the vision and the ministry of CASA. We love you guys, and thank you for the difference you make. Have a wonderful Faith Promise weekend. Thank you, Mission Church, for partnering with us in our Wycliffe ministry. Your Faith Promise giving allows us to bring the gospel to all the nations. Hello Mission Church, my name is Josh, I've been at the church for about three years now and I have the honor and privilege to be leading our Romania mission trip next year. Um, I just want to thank you guys for supporting us so we can go out and partner with the Open Door Foundation over there, which is an organization that, part, that specializes in the aftercare and rehabilitation of survivors of human trafficking. On this Faith Promise Sunday, we just wanted to say thanks for the support and if you have any questions about the trip, please feel free to reach out. Hi, Mission Church. This is Brian from Coca Gracias. Want to say hello here from Arizona. I just got back from a two week trip in Honduras. After six months of being locked down, I was able to go home and see our team, see the ministry, and get good news about what God has been doing. Uh, honestly, the ministry looks better now than when we left it uh, back in January. I was able to go to the mountains to a place called Brisas de San Antonio where we helped install electricity back in April and they, they let me eat a sopa de gallina, it was very good and uh, they were very thankful for the support that we gave them. Estamos agradecidos con Dios, primero oramos a Dios y después empezamos a, también a, a tocar puertas y gracias a Dios porque Cocal Gracias pues verdad, nos ha dicho presente Gracias porque tenemos el proyecto ya en Brisas de San Antonio. Eh, los vecinos están muy contentos. I also got to see the Children's Center, the Timothy Center that we are currently constructing in Agua Caliente. We are in the end of the construction of the first two classrooms, our first phase. Uh, we still need to construct the gymnasium, the kitchen, the bathrooms, and the offices, uh, but we're very excited about the vision. Pastor Juan was excited telling me about his team and the people that are coming on board in the community to help with this project. It's a big, big dream, and we're really excited to move forward 
forward with it. And we just want to say thank you to Mission Church for all your support all over the years. Thank you for your faith promise uh, because this is what it goes to. When you support faith promise, you're supporting ministries like Coca Gracias and others around the world. And we appreciate it. And God bless. Thank you. Maybe the chaos isn't new. Endless war, expanding threats, devastating illness, all of it terrifying, all of it piling up. But one thing has changed. It's never been easier to take it all in, to see the chaos unfold in real time while only barely being touched by it. It's never been more possible to be of the world without really being in it. Will those of us who worship Christ stand at the water's edge, wishing for the lost to be warmed and fed? Or will we spend our lives in worship by becoming the living sacrifices who stop hoping the chaos won't reach us and start carrying the hope of the gospel to those already drowning. Maybe it's time to go. Let your word move in power. Let 
Bienvenidos hermanos y hermanas, welcome once again brothers, sisters and siblings in Christ to Mission Church of the Nazarene. My name is Jeff Burtzell and I've got some announcements about things going on in the life of the church. As some of you may remember from last week, we are now in week two of our Faith Promise Emphasis. These are weekends where we intentionally dedicate time and another resource that's a little scarce, money, to really provide opportunities for some of the work that's being done globally and locally. Last week, uh, you got to hear some amazing stories about what's happening through your giving in Hermosillo, Mexicali, Bolivia, Honduras, and Romania, and places all across the globe. This week, we'll pl be placing emphasis on some of the local opportunities that we have. Hey, if you didn't check out last week, that's archived on YouTube. You can hear some of the ways that lives are being changed in the name of Christ all over the globe. It was an amazing service. Uh, this week, we want to focus again on that backpack drive, some of the local work that Faith Promise is doing. Uh, so that backpack drive for $40, we can deck out a backpack that will be given to children at Foster Elementary School. That opportunity uh, uh, is finishing up here fairly quickly, and that will end, kind of put the end on our Faith Promise emphases. Also, we still have the opportunity beginning on November 15th to partner with Angel Tree Ministries, take a tag off the tree, uh, pack a box with the gifts requested for the child in the age range that you've selected, uh, and, and send those back into the church so that we can be giving gifts on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated during this Christmas season. I know, I know, it's November and we're celebrating Thanksgiving too. And in addition to celebrating Thanksgiving, November is also Veterans Day. Veterans Day is on November 11th and so I wanted to send uh, a special uh, note of thanks and appreciation to the veterans in our congregation um, and all over the place for their service. Uh, thank you for that as well. We're so glad you've joined us this week. Hope that God blesses you as you worship with us through song, through the hearing of the word, and through prayer. Uh, if you need any assistance, prayer, or you have some requests that you'd like to see addressed, please contact the church office. We would be happy to begin uh, the prayer chain for you. God bless you all and have a wonderful week.
stand on those words today, that he is Lord, Lord of all, the cornerstone. And here at Mission Church, we take this time to pause and to thank God for all that we have, for the, all that he has provided. No matter where we're at in life, in the lows and the highs, he is walking along with us. And God, we just come to you right now, and we just thank you for that. We thank you that you are our way maker our healer, our provider, the hope in a world that sometimes seems a little chaotic and dreary at times. We praise you. We just again thank you for all that you've given us. We give it back to you in this moment.
church. Welcome to our second week of missions emphasis in our faith promise time. Let's bow and pray together. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are a miracle worker now in our world. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the privilege of worship and celebration. And as we come to your word this morning, we pray that once again, you would help us to see the promise you have given to us, that you will be with us always to the end of the age as we live out this great commission that you have given to us. Guide us into your truth. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Sunday morning, and on the continent of Africa, the sun is just setting, and that means there are 25,000 new Christians. And the sun will set tomorrow, and there will be 25,000 new Christians on the continent of Africa. And on Tuesday, the sun will set, and there will be 25,000 more. And every day of the year, over 10 million a year are coming to know Christ on the continent of Africa. In the last 100 years in sub-Saharan Africa, the population percentage has gone from 9% Christian to 63% Christian. Out of the 2.4 million people, billion people in the world, a quarter of those now live on the continent of Africa. God has done amazing things in our lifetimes. We see church growth in Indonesia and in South America and Korea and the Philippines, all over the world. God is at work in the fulfillment of this great commission. It's Sunday, and that means since last Sunday, there are 1,500 new churches outside of North America. Every week, 1,500 new Christian churches are formed. The third world nations are now sending missionaries to the United States and other world areas as the world sends nationalities everywhere. We are seeing an amazing time of outreach. In the last 50 years, while Catholics and mainstream Protestant denominations have been withdrawing missionaries and ceasing to send missions, others have sent out missionaries. Evangelical churches have sent nearly four times the number of missionaries we were sending before that. And so we've seen the result of that. Those mainstream churches that are withdrawing missionaries have shrunk in size as denominations, while churches such as ours and Christian Missionary Alliance, Salvation Army, the Southern Baptists who are sending missionaries are growing. It is clear that with mission concern comes growth, and with decreasing mission comes decreasing size in our church. And so we recognize what uh, Barry shared with us last week is God's purpose for us. Look at the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Sometimes I'm afraid in this great commission we've come upon a Christian weariness. In this time of pandemic, uh, the, the term of COVID weariness has come up. And sometimes I think we have in our Christian faith a weariness. And so it, I want to remind us from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So often in scripture, the psalmist and other writers cry out to God, how long, how long will we suffer? How long will we be going through this difficulty? And God never answers that how long with any specific number. He just simply says, I will be with you. The answer to our suffering is the presence of God. The absent answer to our apathy is the presence of God. To our weariness is the presence of God. And so Christians, well-meaning Christians, have set out to their best in following Christ and his teaching, but somewhere along the way have lost joy and enthusiasm and, and sense of mission. And so this Christian weariness is something we must combat constantly. Jesus knew we were in this for the long run, and so he gave us the great commandment and the great commission. He said, first of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And then this great commission to go into all the world and teach the gospel. He gives us a purpose to live for and the motivation to keep us moving toward that purpose. The motivation is his presence by his Holy Spirit. We've been talking about that for the last two months. 
how He has given His Spirit to live within us. And His final word in that commission is that He will be with us, and certainly within us. Satan has used a lot of things to uh, create this Christian weariness. One of the things he's used is that we are just saturated with hype in our culture. Every commercial strives to inspire us to their purposes. Every political candidate has told us that if we'll just do what they want us to do, somehow that will solve all of our problems. Talk of our worldwide mission begins to sound like one more attempt at empty inspiration. But Jesus gives us this purpose. The unknown leaves us with fear, but Jesus offers us presence. And the presence of God motivates us, and it is sufficient. Satan has used nationalism to discourage our ministry around the world. Strife between makes, nations makes us believe that we can't spread the gospel in other lands. But we're not striving to spread democracy or nationalism. We're striving to spread the kingdom of God and the good news of Jesus Christ. So many of our missionaries now are in fields where we can't even announce their presence. We call them creative access fields. Many of them Muslim nations where we cannot send missionaries. But what we're finding is great revivals in those Muslim countries. Because even though we can't hold open services, our missionaries are there and have established a Christian presence. And what God is doing is by the thousands, he is sending visions of Jesus Christ to Muslims. And without knowing what they're supposed to do, they seek out a Christian and say, I got this vision, tell me what this means. Who is this Jesus and what is he getting into my dreams for? We're seeing an amazing transformation in these nations. I'll never forget, we were on the World Youth Conference when it was in Oaxpec, Mexico. And there was a, a gathering of Hispanic students in one of the quads. And I came up around the outside of the circle and everything was going on in Spanish and someone was translating for those of us around the edge of the circle who didn't speak Spanish. And there were students from two different countries, Nicaragua and Honduras, and at that time, their countries were at war. It was a border dispute and there were people dying in this war between their countries. And what they were doing was embracing each other in the center of this circle and saying, our love for Christ is more important than the visions of our countries. And so we recognize that that which unites us is more important than the things that would divide us. Another thing Satan has used is, is the just influx of our media. Every day on our televisions, on our computer screens, everywhere we look is, is starvation and disaster and death around the world. And sometimes there's just this saturation of caring that we just can't keep up with it. And so we need to see that in this misunderstanding of the church's mission, the mission is primary for us. This isn't something that the church added on after they'd uh, been around for a while. Jesus began with this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore you, you see the transfer of authority? Jesus says, authority has been given to me, therefore you go and make disciples of all nations. It's the primary task that he gave us and promised to be with us. And so world mission is our chief purpose. We recognize it and we reach out. And lack of knowledge about missions is being combated all the time here in our local congregation. Barry and all of his missions council last Sunday, and as we look again this week, are constantly giving us information. We have missionary speakers in on a regular basis. We have our mission trips, which give us firsthand experience of the work around the world. Finally, Satan has used good old-fashioned selfishness to cut back our mission. Because... So often we're more concerned with comforts here at home than necessities around the world. But these symptoms of Christian weariness can be overcome. We need to realize, first of all, it can be fatal to the Christian church. If we cease to reach out, we cease to be filled within. We must care for others. Outreach is essential. Jesus said, whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. We have the illustration of Jonah in the Old Testament with the uh, two lessons he needed to learn of, first of all, obedience and then compassion. Really, the four chapters of Jonah are more about the prophet than they are about the prophecy. In all four chapters, there's only one line of prophecy. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. 
But it's all about Jonah's battle in this loss of compassion and concern. He had grown weary in being a prophet. The brief command to Jonah was go to Nineveh and preach. It would be the equivalent if someone said to us, go to ISIS and evangelize. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were ruthless barbarians, actively involved in child sacrifice. They were, had perverted cult worship. Uh, the nations that they overran, they would kill all of the pregnant women to keep them from having to transport them. They would set hooks in the flesh of their slaves to string them all together. They were just horrible people. And Jonah wanted justice. He didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach for their repentance. And so he headed the opposite way, intent to get as far away from God and the possibility of what God had up wanted from him as he possibly could. So he booked a passage on a ship to Tarshish, 1,000 miles from his home and 1,500 miles from Nineveh. Often when God calls us, we head in the opposite direction. Trying to run from God's call is always a mistake. The psalmist said, how do we hide from God? <laughs> Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. David recognized that wherever we go, God is there. And Jonah finally realized wherever he went that God was there. He taught him the lesson of obedience with the, the fish that swallowed him and spit him out on the land. The second time God commanded him to go to Nineveh, he obeys. But he needed one more lesson, and that was the lesson of compassion. He prophesied destruction for Nineveh. An amazing thing happened. The people repented. From the least to the greatest, it says, this great revival swept through Nineveh. The book of Jonah is still read on Yom Kippur as an example of the fruit of repentance. And so Jonah says, God, destroy them. You promised to destroy them. I prophesied that you would destroy them. Nothing that I said will come true. He was more worried about his status as a prophet than he was about the standing of these people in coming to repentance. And what about us? Are we more concerned with our status than we are the needs of the world? The illustration of Jonah is crucial for us. And God taught him this little lesson about compassion. Had on this blistering hot day, had a vine grow up to give him shade. And Jonah gave thanks to God for the shade that the vine provided, but then it withered and died. And Jonah complained about the vine dying. And God said, you complain about that vine, shouldn't I have compassion on these people? To our day, are we more concerned about little things, about little shelter, about little comforts, than we are about the big things that God wants us to be concerned about? about going to all the world to tell, to baptize, to teach, to seek the kingdom, to serve the community, to reach the world, to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. God has called us to be missionaries, whether it's here or around the world. He has called us <clears throat> to overcome this Christian weariness. Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Last week, we closed the service by saying, take, singing, take my life and let it be consecrated to thee. To be consecrated to God. That's the antidote for this Christian weariness. To be consecrated means to be given completely to something. C. Stanley Jones said, we will never be completely committed to something until it takes up every part of our lives. We want to allow Christ to so consume us that everything is mission. That everything we do, everything we say is about reaching out to others with this great gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to leave you this morning with two stories of mission. Because one of our mission trips this year is to Romania, I, I looked up one of my favorite stories of the Romanian church and one of my heroes, Peter Dugalescu. 
this Baptist minister and freedom fighter in Romania during the years when communism was disintegrating in the social Soviet countries. And it was in 1990, Pastor Dugalescu had been threatened by the secret police. He'd been warned by somebody who knew their plot to watch out for trucks and buses, said, keep your family safe. And sure enough, the next week, his family was almost run over by a public bus. But at the same time, exciting doors were opening in their ministry. While other communist regimes were crumbling, Ceausescu, the tyrant who held a firm grip on Romania in communism, uh, was reigning with an iron fist. While Gorbachev was meeting with the Pope, Ceausescu was punishing freedom fighters and rebels in his country. In the small town of Timisoara, the pastor and his congregation were locked out of their church. <laughs> and all the churches in town then gathered in a silent protest that Peter de Galescu's church had been locked up. They had a silent vigil of prayer and fasting in the city square. Ceausescu heard about this and ordered that shots be fired into any gathering in that town. And as shots were echoing through the city in the days to come, cries of down with communism and God exists and God is with us were ringing out throughout the city. While his church was locked up, Pastor Peter stood out in front of his church and preached. We're already free, he says. We are freed by God. And he closed in that Advent season in Romania with a Romanian carol that had not been sung publicly for 40 years. What wonderful news is coming from Bethlehem that we have now a Savior. And the entire population of that small town gathered in the town square and sang together this hymn from their past. Ceausescu had been out of the country and came back incensed that such a display had been allowed. He set up his own rally in Bucharest for December 21st, but the planned shouts in his favor were drowned out by shouts of the freedom fighters. Ceausescu ordered that shots be fired into the crowd. When his chief of, of the army refused to fire those shots, he himself was shot and killed. The army scattered. Ceausescu made an effort to flee the country. And the news reached the little town of Timisoara once again. And Peter Dugalescu said, I want to speak to you in the name of God. All of our lives, we have been told he didn't exist. He asked them to join with him in the Lord's Prayer. And they knelt across that city square. That Christmas morning, the church bells rang in that town for the first time in 40 years. It was the Christmas of 1990 when communism was falling all around the world, and now, finally, that fall came to Romania. Romanian TV announced God has turned his face back to Romania. Ceausescu, who had been captured in his vain attempt to exit the country, was executed on Christmas Day after being tried for crimes against the people and genocide. Freedom once again to worship. Time magazine at the time treated the story politically and ignored the religious revival. They named Mikhail Gorbachev man of the decade. But really, God was at work in the lives of Christian missionaries and Christians within this communist bloc country. On May Day of that next year in Moscow, it was kind of summed up in Red Square. They had their traditional march of all of the military display and tanks and guns. But behind the tanks and guns came a, uh, another parade a crowd shouting bread and freedom and truth, and a group of priests carrying an eight-foot cross as they passed below Gorbachev, raised the cross high, and one of the priests cried out, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, Christ is risen. <laughs> Within months, the communist bloc, as we knew it then, officially dissolved, and Christ has been building his church for these 30 years since. It's our privilege to be there in a mission trip this year. Think of where that country has come with the freedom that Christ provides. Some missionary stories are about huge salvation of thousands in a country that was oppressed. But the other story I want to leave you with is just about a mom and a daughter. Maria lived in a small village outside of Rio de Janeiro and she 
she had lost her husband shortly after their daughter Christina had been born. So all of Maria's life was given then to raising Christina. Her job as a maid provided only the basics, but it was a house that was filled with love. Christina grew up loved, beautiful, but also independent, and had dreams of the big city. Her mother warned her of the cruelty that was there if she made her way to Rio. But sure enough, one day she had a note and her daughter was gone. Mario followed her with all the money that she had, went to a drugstore photo booth, and there spent all the money she had on snapshots of herself. And on each snapshot, she wrote a little note on the back. Aware of the city's traps for a young girl with no money, she went to every bar, nightclub, cheap hotel, coffee shop. At every place, she taped one of those pictures on the mirror of the bathroom, on a bulletin board, wherever she could find to put that picture. Scattered them as many places as she could find in the inner city in Rio. Maria, in frustration and out of money, finally returned home. A month later, Christina came down the stairs of the cheap hotel where she was living after falling into prostitution. Her dream of the big city had become a nightmare. The laughter gone, she longed for home, but she felt like she'd cut off all hope. She came down the stairs and saw the picture of her mother. She grabbed it, looked on the back, and read the note which said, whatever you've done, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. Missions is about finding those prodigals as well as evangelizing the masses. We reach out in mission to the individual and to the country. To the one needy one next door to us and to the country around the world. God has called us to mission. He has called us to overcome any Christian weariness and give us that word from Galatians. Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Father, we come before you in this faith promise emphasis of last Sunday and this and realize that you have called us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Father, we rejoice in who you are. We rejoice in your saving grace. And we rejoice that you have chosen to include us in your plan of salvation. All authority, you said, had been given to me. Therefore, you disciples go and make other disciples. Tell them, teach them, baptize them, establish them in the faith. We thank you, Father, for a church that believes in mission. We pray that as we give today to our faith promise, that you would be a, help us be aware of what you have in store for us in the days to come. In the name of Christ, amen. Church, I would encourage you to take your faith promise card. Give us your pledge for this coming year. This is not about what we can afford. Faith promise is not about a budgeting item. It's something that God will provide, and we're trusting him to provide. And a great deal of value of our faith promise pledge will be to see how God provides that which he has put on our hearts to give. Let's give to the world around us that we may reap a harvest in due time. God bless you. Have a great day.